Sydney. Oh yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> right, we're rolling to uh, West Wilkman. It's been my privilege to be the director of West Wilkman Housing Cooperative for the last 200 years, in actual fact. In 1989, the organisation was formed, and it was certainly my privilege, as you can imagine, at a very young age, to be appointed to the short trousers and a cap at the interview, uh, to be appointed to the cooperative's first director. Just give you a quick contextual background on West Wilkman. With, with one, excuse me, how's it called? But the trees are May moment there. Uh, a not for profit, fully mutual housing cooperative for exit social landlord with charity status, which is an interesting organisational identity formed in 1989. 100% tenant membership, really important in terms of community democracy and community control. We've got 644 houses for rent, and the overall scale of things, uh, not a huge number of houses when you look at the large housing associations, particularly in England and the bigger ones in Scotland, but that's where community identity becomes really, really important. 67% of West Scotland stock is multi story. I was interested in Ben's comments on Grenfell, and obviously we did a very close analysis and scrutiny uh, across three themes in actual fact form Grenfell, the technical theme, operational theme, and the communications theme to our tenants in terms of tenant safety and security, and the psychological effect of, of Grenfell on people living in multi story uh, flats. We're the fifth largest housing cooperative in the UK, which says something again about the scale of cooperative organisations in the United Kingdom. We've got 33 staff. Anybody who's got a quick mental arithmetic calculator will see we've got a very high stock to staff ratio there. With only uh, 644 houses, we've got nearly 40 staff. Uh, part of that is by virtue of the fact that we've got a community resource centre for economic, health, educational, social, and recreational projects, which is a huge uh, part of the social glue which exists in, in, in the adherence of, of, of West Wall Lawns for all We're proud to be a voluntary tenant controlled housing cooperative, and tenant controls are the essence of housing cooperatives. There are very few in Scotland currently, unfortunately. There's only 12 registered housing cooperatives in Scotland. That's, that's a problem and it's something I'm very keen to, uh, to, to, to focus on and roll out how that can be expanded. It's social accountancy, I'm, I'm fairly confident most people in the room will be familiar with the term social accountants. We put people first, we measure value, we measure quality, not quantity. Uh, the Scottish Housing Regulator is an important player in the, the Scottish housing market in social housing terms. We have a low engagement with the Scottish Housing Regulator and that's very pleasing that allows us to get on with things the way that we so choose to get on with them on the ground. So the cooperative model, is, is it sexy? Does it work? <laughs> or is it actually a puny wee irrelevance? That's a huge debate in housing in Scotland and the UK just now in actual fact. Let's talk about co-ops for a minute. I'm sure people will have an awareness of cooperatives and a worldwide scale and worldwide dimension of cooperatives. Uh, people familiar with the International Cooperative Alliance? Some clearly established, very successful cooperatives. Uh, Barcelona Football Club in the top. Oh, if you're looking at the top left, it's a bit of an old picture of that. Uh, Mondragon, I'm fairly sure a number of people will be aware of Mondragon, which is actually the fifth or sixth largest commercial entity in Spain. It's a cooperative. People who have had toast for breakfast this morning may well have used Luck Pack Butter, which is a cooperative. You may well have bought it in the cooperative shop in the bottom right hand corner. And those cooperative entities are, are, are all as a result of, uh, by and large in the UK, those people at the bottom left hand corner of the screen there. That, that's not the Queen's Park Football Club I played for in the 1970s. That's uh, with very famed Rochdale pioneers. Let's focus on West Wilkeburn. West Scotland, physical problems, the challenges associated with the physical problems of West Scotland when we arrived there in 1989. Flat roofs, exposed panel joints, dampness and water penetration, quickly you can see the exposed panel joints there. Poor quality single glazed windows, very poor and expensive heating systems which I want to focus on in relation to poverty if I've got time this morning. And no gas in the properties due to structural issues, people may remember a gas explosion at Wooden Point in London some years ago. Uh, ugly and unattractive, simple as that. That was West Waterburn when, when we arrived there. Uh, we've also changed the weather, as you can see. The, 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 the climate control is an important aspect of West Waterburn's ongoing philosophy. Down near Concierge Station, we've got a huge console where we bring in a bit of sunshine and a bit of rain, depending on what climate we need to, need to create. But you can see that very clearly the visual impact of change in sunny West Waterburn. Before and afters there, social problems, the physical, uh, tangible problems in the, 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 the fabric of the property was, was very difficult. The social fabric was, was torn, I'm still, still on the line from Leonard Cohen there, which I'm, I'm sure as you had a, a friend will recognise. 
is uh, the social fabric of my spot one was torn. High crime rate, high level of hard drug supply and hard drug use, vandalism, graffiti, a big psychological fear of crime, which is an interesting concept. Social chaos uh, and no demand for the properties and very high turnover of the properties. In simple terms, I know it's 20 odd years later, but the simple uh, indicators, uh, the, the key performance indicators from our perspective are very clearly very high demand for West Scotland housing stock currently. It's very low turnover, people have voted with their feet, they want to stay. Very low crime rate, and from our most recent tenant satisfaction survey, 94% of our tenants are saying they're satisfied with what we do. We shouldn't get jelly babies for that, we shouldn't get any applauded, we're here to do that job. And with appropriate resources, determination, community control, that can be achieved. Again, just some indicators in terms of this community control actually work. 75% of cooperatives registered in Scotland are higher than the Scottish average uh, level of tenant satisfaction. The average level in the Housing Association RSLs is 89%. Three quarters of co-ops are, are higher than that. Zero percent of cooperatives in Scotland are high engagement with the Scottish Housing Regulator. That says something for me in a, in a professional sense. Only 8% are medium engagement, 92% are low engagement, and comparative RSLs, housing associations and other forms of housing organisations, 37%, that's more than one in three, are either high or medium engagement with the Scottish Housing Regulator. Committee members, core of the, the matter, voluntary, volunteerism, what, what motivates committee members to volunteer? In West Scotland's case, it was absolute like crisis back in 1989. And again, you can look at some of the befores and afters, the physical stock. We, we, where are we now? What should we be doing? Here for me is a really important message to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Housing Regulator. What about a bit more focus on community control? I know people talk about the, the, the Land Empowerment Act and things of that nature, but a specific housing sense. Focus on community control, community empowerment, community democracy and community needs has, has been uh, evapor evaporating for me over the last 10 years. That's not good enough and certainly we are evangelists and we're advocates of far greater focus from the government and the regulator on those principal uh, democratic ideals. Here's an interesting one. The minister's view over, over the last month, in fact, a, a, a letter he wrote to me was saying very clearly that the Scottish government does not promote one form of social landlord over another. I'm, I'm curious about that statement. Why not, if one is demonstrably more successful than the other, why not promote it? There's been no new housing cooperatives registered in Scotland in the past 10 years. Things are very different in England, Ireland, Northern Ireland and Wales. Uh, we, we run a wee convention with Solibur in, in October, bringing up someone from, uh, from CCH in England to describe what's happening in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But we're very clear that there's far greater degree of cooperative promotion and development in housing terms in England and Northern Ireland and Wales and there is in Scotland just now. So the mutual cooperative, why is it the best model in town? Community democracy, part of the global empire, we're now on a level fiscal and legal playing field with other ourselves and there's a political support which okay, is, is, is diminished recently in terms of the cooperative party's position. But again, a demonstrable national and international track record of success. Uh, the future is bright in cooperative, I'm, I'm very conscious of time here, so you mentioned fuel poverty. Fuel poverty, a crucial issue for, issue for Scottish housing. Who is most likely to suffer from uh, fuel poverty? Anyone who relies on electricity for heating their homes are twice as likely to be affected than others in the gas grid. We had a triple whammy problem in West Wilderburn, the West Wilderburn fuel poverty problem. White meter, high and rising fuel costs, low incomes, a triple whammy for tenants in relation to what they were being served with. Our solution, why don't we do it ourselves? Why don't we try and break up that cartel of the big six energy suppliers? Brave step, but we took a view four years ago to become the not-for-profit energy supply company. It's working tremendously successfully. Now I've got to say, quite a lot of team problems, but it's working. The plan was to introduce a retrofit biomass district heat system for 544 of our properties. We become the ESCO, we become the, the not-for-profit uh, fuel supplier uh, on the estate. We partner with Empower for SES Community Energy Saving Programmes and Eco uh, Partners, uh, our partners with, with Empower. Capital costs are about £7 million, about £12.5 grand a unit. But here's interesting in terms of Scottish Government intervention and support. The Scottish Government's intervention and support with a loan, a loan facility of £1.5 million, and 3.5% interest over 15 years. CPI currently 2.7, do the maths, you know. That's the highest it's been for a while. Clearly, a government yield of 8.8% uh, on people who, is, who are in fuel poverty. I, I would absolutely declare that as a nice government earner on the back of fuel poverty. 
Is that addressed with fuel poverty? I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. Yeah, it's a revolving loan and that money will go back into other projects, but at the same time, the people who are paying the premium and paying the yield are tenants in the, the, the lowest income in, in our estate. Very quickly, uh, revenue savings. There are environmental benefits, of course, 1,600 tonnes of CO2 saved. The tenants' position is quite clearly they've saved an average 20% uh, for tenants' fuel bills, and the fuel cost to our tenants of £8.5 a week. Our tenants, before the fuel poverty project, currently our tenants, currently. <laughs> before the fuel poverty, that was our housing stock, currently <laughs> The future is bright, Warren, thanks very much for your time.